which we'll check out afterwards because I cannot express enough how beautiful the variants and the border treatments they're doing for Midnight Hunt. They have to be like one of my favorite looking cards ever. Um, and just as a reminder, if you haven't, use code uh, PARCELMEYER in the Magic the Gathering Arena shop and you will get a bunch of free coins, um, some free cards, a free sleeve, and a free card variant, uh, art variant. So that's a very good code to use. Oh, and my arena is working. Rewards? For what? Oh, because I... Wait. Because I was in the middle of playing that... Uh, Frog game mode, maybe? Anyway. Yeah, use the... Um, Alright, I want to see if the bundles were in the store. They are not? Did they take them out? Strange. Well, maybe I'll look and see if we can find a reason why they might have done that. Don't know. Uh, but yeah, new code for the store, Parcel Meyer. Appreciate it. It's uh, some interesting stuff. I got some good stuff. Got some good cards in there. Including a Mythic Rare, which was awesome. So, let's jump back in. Innistrad previews were this week. We have, um, I believe, the, the pre-release event is next weekend. So, definitely come back to this channel and we're going to be opening up a pre-release set and we'll build a deck uh, from there and then probably join some games on spell table because uh, people are shitty and aren't taking COVID seriously still so we are most likely not going to be back in store for events anytime soon There, there's a few shops in my neighborhood that have opened back up to very limited amounts of people all wearing masks um, and everyone has to be double vaxxed so it's a bit of a hassle to get into the store for events so I'm assuming that Wizards will once again be hosting preview or pre-release events and games on Spelltable so we can play online with some people um, if you wanna play or if you're participating in the preview pre-release event let me know and we can get you an invite to our discord and we can play some games over spell table um we can do some one-on-ones we can uh set up a tournament maybe anyway that's most likely next weekend i think yep the 11th the weekend of the 11th um so that will be really fun we'll get to play with some midnight hunt cards a week early and then the following week Midnight Hunt comes out. So it's very exciting. So these are all the cards that have been revealed so far, whether or not through Magic channels or through influencer channels. And let's just go down the list and check out each one. We'll stop and talk about all of the mechanics that are new to Magic or are new in this set as we come across them. Like this first one, Candle Trap. Um, Candle Trap, I'm going to zoom in on this browser a bit more so that the cards are larger. So, Candle Trap is a one mana. These are white cards, just in case you didn't see that. Uh, Candle Trap is one white. It's an aura enchantment. Enchant creature has defender, which means it prevents all combat damage that would be dealt by enchanted creature. So it can defend, but it can no longer attack. Uh, this card also has the new ability called Coven. So you pay two and a white and sacrifice candle key trap. Exile enchanted creature. Activate only if you control three or more creatures with different powers. And so 
this new coven mechanic is very interesting because you can make covens or you classify it's kind of like the party mechanic where you need a warrior and a wizard and a rogue um but in this specific case you have a coven if you have three or more creatures that are all different power levels so what you want to do is build a board state with a 3-3 three, three, and a 1-1 one, one, and a 4-4 four, four, and that way you have a coven so you can use coven abilities like this sacrifice candle trap ability so the candle trap is basically the portable hole of um Innistrad midnight hunt you turn a a creature into a defender and then if you have coven you can pay three and that creature gets exiled forever the second new card is Gavany Dawnguard creature human soldier he's one and two white one and a white white and it has ward one and this has a uh, day night trigger so the new mechanics in Innistrad Midnight Hunt have to do with day and night because uh, werewolves obviously so there's a general board state now instead of just single cars having day nights it's a whole the whole board is either day or night um, and cards like the Gavany Dawn Guard have triggers in their abilities that change the board state so Dawn Guard says if it's neither day nor night it becomes day as Dawn Guard enters the battlefield. So if there's no board state yet, so it's the start of a game or near the beginning of a game, and um, if you've ever played games with the Monarch ability, so when you, there's no Monarch in a normal, um, there's no Monarch in a normal Magic game, but if you have a card that makes you the monarch then you have a monarch in the game for the rest of the game and whoever deals damage to the monarch gets to take the monarch crown and they get all the benefits um, of being the monarch until they are dealt damage and then they lose the monarch and this is kind of the same thing so at the start of a magic game there's no day or night it's just a blank board state and then as soon as something comes onto the board like this dawn guard that triggers the day night cycle then for the rest of the game, it's either day or night on your board. Uh, the Dawn Guard changes the board state into day. It doesn't, it doesn't change it from night to day, but if there's no board state, then it puts day into play, if that makes sense. I'm going to go through the mechanics. Um, WotC has posted a mechanics article on here, and we'll see how they describe it. Maybe I'm just not um, getting my words very accurately down, which is uh, a Saturday morning fatigue thing, I guess. So the rest of this card says, whenever day becomes night or night becomes day, look at the top four cards of your library. You may reveal a creature card with mana value three or less from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library. So when Dawn Guard enters the battlefield, it uh, changes the board state from nothing to day. And then for the rest of the game, as long as Dawn Guard's on board, every time the day-night cycle switches, uh, you get to look at the top four cards of your library and grab a creature from it. This was pretty good. It's three mana. It's a 3-3. Three, three. It's a pretty great uh, card. That's a solid trade-off. And again, like the Monarch thing, you need cards like the Dawn Guard to kickstart the day-night cycles. Um, on one sec. All right, so the last white card that we've got so far is Unruly Mob. It's one and a white for a human creature, 1-1. One, one. Whenever another creature you control dies, put a 1-1 one, one counter on Unruly Mob. So as your creatures die, the mob gets more unruly and gets more powerful. This is a classic white card, um, and it has this kind of humans versus the monsters 
kind of vibe to it, which is going, which is in um, Innistrad quite a bit. I just realized my mouse cursor wasn't showing. So anything I was pointing at fervently was not being seen. I apologize. Uh, yeah, it's just a basic card that gets pumped every time your your cards die, your creatures die. Um, classic white scenario. A good card to have. It's uh, two mana for a 1-1, one, one, but by the end of the game, who knows? It could be a 5-5, five, five, a 6-6. Six, six. Now we've got blue. So the first card we have in blue is Consider. It's a uh, one blue. It's an instant. Look at the top card of your library. You may put that card into your graveyard and then draw a card. So it's kind of like um, Deliberate, where... You can scry one and then draw, but instead of putting the card in the bottom of your library, if you don't want it, you have to put it into your graveyard. And because this is a monsters, Halloween-y, spooky set, there's going to be a lot of graveyard plays, so putting it into your graveyard might be a good strategy. Not super crazy. Pretty standard blue card. Um, the standard scry scenario. Uh, the next card is Ominous Roost. It's two and a blue for an enchantment. Ominous Roost enters the battlefield when Ominous Roost, sorry, enters the battlefield or whenever you cast a spell from your graveyard, create a 1-1 one, one blue bird creature token with flying and this creature can bl block only creatures with flying. So you're basically creating crows, ravens, whatever you want to call them, um, and they're flying blockers. It's You can have an army of it by the end of the game if you can keep Ominous Roost on your board for a long time. Very, very common kind of blue mechanic where uh, if you think of like Roost of Drakes, uh, it's the same thing whenever you play a kick spell you get a 2-2 Flying Drake. Uh, this is kind of the same jam, but more spooky. Uh, you get a bunch of ravens, 1-1 one, one bird creatures that can only block other creatures with flying. Which is fine, that's great. The next card in blue is Secrets of the Key. And this is interesting because it's got Teferis and um, Arlen here working on something. Two very famous characters in the Magic lore and history. This costs one blue, and it's an instant, and you get to investigate. If this spell was cast from the graveyard, investigate twice. And investigate is you create a colorless clue token with pay two, sacrifice to draw a card. So when you investigate, you just create a clue token, um, and then those clue tokens you can sacrifice to draw a card. So it's nice in a scenario where you're building up a board state and you investigate a bunch of times so that you can have, you know, so let's say four or five clue tokens on the board. And then once you get into a spot where you need card draw, not necessarily want it, but need it, maybe you're down to a couple cards in your hand, um, then you start sacrificing your artifacts, your clue tokens, to draw cards. This also has a flashback, which is a returning mechanic. A flashback is um, an ability that lets you pay far more mana. So this one's three in a blue instead of just one blue. Uh, you pay far more mana to cast this once again from your graveyard. And if you do pay, do if you do flashback a spell, I believe it gets exiled after it's used for the second time. So that is kind of one of those things where you have to keep track of the spells that everything that has flashback that's in your graveyard and when is the right time to you know pay that flashback cost bring them out of the graveyard and then lose them forever okay the next blue card is one that we've seen before it's Trisky Duck Decophile. Triska deca Triskai Decophile. It's one in a blue human wizard, one three power toughness. You have no maximum hand size. At the beginning of your upkeep, if you have exactly 13 cards in your hand, you win the game. 
And you can pay three and a blue to draw a card. I believe this was part of the very original reveal um, for Innistrad Midnight Hunt stuff. So we won't we won't linger on that too much. There's a, a YouTube video on my channel that goes over the original batch of reveals. So we'll jump straight to black. Um, so the new first new black card is the Arrogant Outlaw. It's two and a black for a three-two Vampire Noble. When Arrogant Outlaw enters the battlefield, if an opponent lost life this turn, each opponent loses two more life, and you gain two life. So that's really fun. Um, it's kind of like the vampire spawn from AFR, but a little bit more aggressive, and it doesn't have flash, so you can't play it whenever you want. This is definitely a great second main phase um, card to play, but you should be playing all of your creatures in your second main phase anyway, because you shouldn't put cards with summoning sickness onto the battlefield before combat. Uh, Champion of the Parish is another one of those cards that we had revealed er, earlier in the month. It is a one black for a 1-1 one, one with whenever another zombie enters the battlefield, put a 1-1 one, one counter on Champion of the Parish. So the more zombies you have, the more powerful Champion of the Parish gets. It's one black for a 1-1. One, one. Very good opening hand card for black decks in Innistrad. Uh, the next black card that was revealed is called Defenestrate. Now this is an actual word, an English word, that means to throw someone out of a window. I don't know what the origins are. Defenestrate. Seventeenth century. Oh, you can't see that whole thing anyway. Um, yeah, so the word defenestrate is an old English word from the 17th century that means to toss someone out of a window, basically. Uh, this card is two and a black, or, and it's an instant, and you destroy target creature without flying. So, in lore mechanics, unreality-wise, you're basically throwing a card that doesn't have flying out of a window, and they die. They can't fly away. The next black card is another one that we um, saw weeks ago. It's Infernal Grasp. One in a black. Destroy target creature. You lose two life. Which is fine. The last black is a new card that was revealed this week. And it is Jadar, Ghoul Caller of Nephalia. He's a legendary creature. He's a 1-1, one, one, and he costs 1 and a black. And his card reads, At the beginning of your end step, if you control no creatures with Decayed, create a 2-2 two, two black zombie creature token with Decayed. So, the, new, the Decay mechanic is also new. Um, it generally has a lot to do with zombies, obviously, because zombies decay. They're... Basically, a creature with decaying can't block. And also, when you attack with it, um, you have to sacrifice it at the end of combat. So not the end of your turn, at the end of combat. So if you have an army of decayed zombies, you swing with all of them, and then you can do that much damage, but then that's your one swing. They decay after they um, attack. So that's going to add some interesting stuff to it because there's a lot of mechanics that bring creatures out of the graveyard but add the decay mechanic to them so you get like one more shot with this creature kind of thing. And I find that very interesting. Pardon me. Uh, I feel like I'm starting to get sick so I'm just like teetering on the edge of it. Um, so for red, we've got Brimstone Vandal, two in a red for a 2-3 devil creature with Menace. If it's neither day nor night, it becomes day as Brimstone Vandal enters the battlefield. So once again, another card that triggers the day-night cycle to start. Uh, whenever day becomes night or night becomes day, Brimstone Vandal deals one damage to each opponent. So this is an interesting one to have 
So you have four of them on the battlefield. Every time the day-night cycle switches, you deal four damage to an opponent. Oh, not an opponent, each opponent. So that's interesting, too. Um, then we've got Famished Foragers. It's three and a red for a 4-3 vampire creature. When Famished Foragers enters the battlefield, if an opponent lost life this turn, add three red mana. And then you can pay two and a red to discard a card and draw a card. So this is interesting to play... Um, right before, like, say you do combat, you hopefully hit an opponent, and then in your second main phase, you play Famish Foragers, you get three free mana, so basically this only costs one in the end. So you pay four, play this, you get three more, you get three mana back, and then you can cast something else, which is, which is interesting. That'll... That'll cascade into some, some big plays, I think. Uh, we've got Festival Crasher, which is one and a red for a 1-3 devil creature. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, Festival Crasher gets plus two, plus zero until end of turn. So this is just one of those classic red cards that gets a buff whenever you cast spells. Um, and because this whole Innistrad Midnight Hunt set is based around this kind of harvest festival, um, autumn, natural, midsummer type creepy festival. Um, you got a festival crasher here. He's got a little pumpkin on his head with like a rune carved in it. And he hates festivals. Then we've got Light Up the Night, her X in a red. Light Up the Night deals X damage to any target. It deals X plus one damage instead if that target is a Planeswalker. And then it has Flashback. So you remove X loyalty counters from among Planeswalkers you control. If you cast this spell this way, X can't be zero. So you can Flashback for three and a red, but then you still have to pay X up here. And the way you pay X when you Flashback is by paying it with loyalty counters. And then we've got Play With Fire, which was revealed earlier, and it's one red for an instant. Deal two damage to any target. If a player is dealt damage this way, scry one. Nice little cheeky red card. It's probably going to be in a lot of uh, decks. One mana. And then we'll jump to green. So there's lots of new stuff in green. First up we have Candlelit Cavalry. It's four and a green for a 5-5 five, five human knight creature. And this has Coven. At the beginning of your combat on your turn, if you control three or more creatures with different powers, Candlelit Cavalry gains Trample. So that's really fun. The Coven mechanic is sort of like a passive thing. You, like I said, the it's kind of like the party mechanic where you're trying to collect trying to make a board state where there's a variety of creatures instead of just one creature because in order to have a coven uh, you need to have three creatures with three or you need to control three creatures or more with different powers so if you had this five five this zero zero and this two two that counts that means you have coven you can use coven abilities and this one is Gains Trample at the beginning of combat, which is cool. The next green card is Contortionist Troop. It's, uh, again, going with this festival party theme. It's X and a green for a 0-0 zero, zero human creature. Contortionist Troop enters the battlefield with X 1-1 one, one counters on it. So whatever you pay here is how powerful it is when it enters. And this has Coven as well. So at the beginning of your end step, if you control three or more creatures with different powers, put a 1-1 one, one counter on target creature you control. So this is an insane card because you get to choose where that 1-1 one, one counter goes. And as long as you maintain the coven status and have three or more creatures with different power levels, then you're just going to keep powering up people as long as Contortionist Troop 
remains on the battlefield. Excellent, excellent card. I'm going to save that because I think it is on my list for my top four most hype cards. The next green card is Dawn Heart Rejuvenator, and this art is stellar. That's so cool. It's just got all the spooky seasonal, the color palette is perfect. It's got the dark greens and browns, and then the oranges and, and, and yellows from the fall. I love it. It's three and a green, or a 2-4 human warlock. When Dawn Heart Rejuvenator enters the battlefield, gain three life. And then you can tap Dawn Heart Rejuvenator to add one mana of any color. So this is a powerful, powerful mana dork. You gain three uh, on battlefield entry, and then you can tap for any color mana, not just colorless or green. This is going to be a very, very good card, especially in constr or, uh, sealed drafts. Green players are going to be looking for this guy in draft decks. The next green card is Howl of the Hunt. It's a two and a green for an enchantment aura. <clears throat> it does have flash. You can play it whenever. Enchant creature. When Howl of the Hunt enters the battlefield, if enchant creature is a wolf or werewolf, untap that creature. Oh, shit. And then Enchanting Creature gets plus two, plus two, and has Vigilance. That is... bonkies. So that's going to be a really fun, especially for you werewolf players. That's going to be epic. Um, the untap of the wolf or werewolf is really, really dynamic because you can attack with it. And then because this has flash, you can play it on your enemy's turn, your opponent's turn. Um, as they attack, you can play this and untap your werewolf, and then he gets buffer, and you can block with him. I think holding this in your pocket, you're going to have to keep in mind, when you're playing uh, Innistrad Midnight Hunt, whether or not you're playing Constructed or Sealed, if you're playing against a, mo a green player, and they have three mana up, be prepared for this card. Because it is going to be a doozy. Uh, the next one we have is Might of the Old Ways. It's one and a green for an instant. Target creature gets 2-2 two, two until end of turn. And it has Coven. So, if you control three or more creatures with different p powers, draw a card. So, you get a 2-2 two, two buff, and you get to draw a card, potentially. For two mana. That's pretty good. It's kind of standard. It's not exciting, but it's good. Um, the next card is Pestilent Wolf. It's one and a green for a 2-2 wolf creature, and it has a mana ability. Pay two and a green, and Pestilent Wolf gains Death Touch until end of turn. That is my kind of card. I love Death Touch cards. My favorite. Absolute favorite. Love that card. Uh, okay, the next green is a legendary creature. Serith, the Viper's Fang. It's two, a green, green. For a 3-4 Human Warlock Legendary Creature. And the art on that is very wicked too. It's uh, very slimy, very snake-like. There's a big snake here. Uh, okay. So her card reads, Other trapped creatures you control have death... Other tapped creatures you control have death touch. Other untapped creatures you control have hexproof. Wait. Why would it matter if a tapped creature has death touch? Untapped target creature or land you control. Hmm. I don't understand how that works. So if you have a tapped creature and it gets death touch because it's tapped, when it untaps, it's going to get hexproof, isn't it? Because it, it doesn't say um, when Sarath enters the battlefield, so it's like a passive ability. Tapped creatures you control have death touch. Untapped creatures you control have hexproof. And then it has a pay one and tap Sarath to untap target creature or land. So... As long as you have one mana and Sarath isn't tapped, you can choose whether or not a creature has death touch or hexproof. 
But you can't block or anything with a tapped creature, so what's the point of it having death touch? Hmm. I think I'm going to have to wait and see how that card plays out, because I don't think I get it. Maybe I will put that out in the... Um, I will put that on the Twitterverse and see if anyone can explain it to me. Um, okay. Can anyone explain this card to me? Maybe my, it's my morning brain, but I do not get it. If a creature is tapped, why would I care that it has death touch? Or if, uh, creature with death touch passively gets untapped um it then gains hex proof and loses death touch okay hopefully someone can uh explain that to me because i don't I get it. But other tapped creatures you control have death touch, and other untapped creatures you control have hexproof. So if Sarath is on the board, and I have a tapped creature, so I play Sarath, I have a tapped creature, it gets death touch. But as soon as I untap that creature, it gets hexproof. Right? But so why would I want why would I care that a tapped creature has death touch because I can't block or anything with it makes it harder for opponents to block it gives attacking creatures death touch yes that's how it works oh because when you attack you fucking tap so okay that makes way more thank you so much smug an Anivia main? Oh my god, Anivia mains. Um, yeah, you're right. Because they tap to attack. It is my fucking morning brain. That's brutal. So you have a bunch of untapped creatures. They all have hexproof. So your opponent can't fuck with your creatures. And then when you go to attack, everything you attack with gets death touch. Oh my god. Okay, that makes so much sense. I'm sorry I didn't see your, your message. I don't know how long that was up there. <laughs> Uh, me trying to fucking figure this shit out and not paying attention to your very obvious explanation right there. Um, so that's very interesting. That card is insane because it makes it nearly impossible for um, your opponent to screw with your board while it's not your turn, assuming that... Also, you kind of use mana dorks as death touch blockers. See, true, yeah. True. That's that's really crazy. I never it's it's clicked now. I can see the use for it. That's that's hype. I mean you can't use 
Um, you can't use mana dorks as death touch blockers because you don't tap to block. So if you're, it would just have hexproof. So it rewards you for being defensive by giving you hexproof, and it also rewards you for being offensive by giving you death touch. But there's no like middle ground there. You can tap to add mana. Yeah, but then you can't block with it if it's tapped. In order to block with it, it has to be untapped. So you can tap to add mana, and then it gets death proof, but then it's just tapped, and you can't do anything with it. If anything, you'd want to leave it untapped so that it has hexproof so that they can't kill your mana dorks. Block, then before damage, tap it. Can you do that? Yeah, you can. Fuck. That, that is a bonkers, bonkers plan. This card is crazy. This card is crazy. And it's only gold? It's not even mythic? Alright. Well, I'm still mind blown about Sarith, the Viper's Fang. Um... God, that's going to be so good in my Finn the Fangbearer deck. Oh my god. I'm going to have fun with that in standard. Um, <laughs> so the next green is Snarling Wolf. It's one green for a 1-1 one, one wolf creature. Um, you can pay one and a green, and Snarling Wolf gets 2-2 two, two until end of turn. Activate only once each turn. So you can't buff it a bunch of times. Like most mana abilities. But that's fine. It's one mana for a 1-1, one, one, and then you pay two more mana for a 3-3. Three, three. So it's a three mana total. Um, yeah. So it's an offensive card, not a defensive card. Oh, wait. No, you can do it defensively, too. God, my mind is still reeling from that Serith Viper's Fang card. I'm all right. So the last uh, green, mono green card we have here is Renin 7, which is a card that was revealed a few weeks ago. Uh, so it's not new. It's a mythic planeswalker. It's three, a green green. It comes in the battlefield with five loyalty tokens or loyalty counters. Uh, you can plus one to reveal top four cards of your library. Put all land cards revealed this way into your hand and the rest into your graveyard. Uh, you can zero the loyalty and put any number of land cards from your hand onto the battlefield tapped. You can minus three loyalty to create a green tree folk creature token with reach. And this creature's power and toughness are equal to the number of lands you control. But once you've ramped uh, in your green deck, because green likes to ramp, um, you do your minus three and you get a pretty buff tree folk, tree folk creature. Um, and then you can minus eight to return all permanent cards from your graveyard to your hand. You get an emblem that says you have no maximum hand size. So this is uh, a pretty bonkers card. But we're not going to linger on it too much because it was revealed a few weeks ago, so it's not part of this new batch of reveals. Uh, let's move on to multicolored. There's a couple here. Um, Galvanic Iteration is a blue-red card. Is it an is it card? It's a one blue, one red for an instant. When you cast your next instant spell or sorcery this turn, copy that spell. You may choose new targets for this copy. And it has flashback. So you pay one, a blue, and a red, and you can cast this again from your graveyard. Um, and then exile it. So that's good. It doubles up your um, spell casting, especially if you're playing Is It. You have a lot of control cards. You got a lot of lightning bolts. Um, that'll be fun for for uh, Is It players. And it's got flashback, which is the returning mechanic that a lot of people love. Basically, you pay a little bit more mana to play something again from the graveyard, and then once it's played a second time, you have to exile it. And then we've got Join the Dance, which is another card that was revealed a few weeks back. It's a green and a white 
sorcery, create two 1-1 one, one white human creature tokens. This also has flashback. So you pay three, a green and a white, and you can play this again uh, from the graveyard. And the last multicolored card we have on this gallery is uh, newly revealed on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday. Sigarda, Champion of Light. It's one, a green, a white, white, or a 4-4 four, four legendary creature angel. Flying and trample. Humans you control get a 1-1. One, one. So if you're playing a green, white, humans, angels deck, this is a great commander to have because all of your humans will get a 1-1. One, one. It also has the coven ability, so the coven ability can only be activated um, when you have three or more creatures on your battlefield with different powers. So you have to have uh, a variety of creatures in order to get the coven mechanic. And Sigarda's coven mechanic is when Sigarda attacks, if you control three or more creatures with different powers, which means you have a coven, you may reveal a human creature card from among them and put it into your hand. Wait, what? Oh, sorry, I didn't read that other sentence. <laughs> Whenever Sigarda attacks, you may look at the top five cards of your library. You may reveal a human creature card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. That's dope because obviously you want more humans on the board. Maybe you play Sigarda as your um, commander in your commander deck and every other creature you have is a human or another angel that buffs humans. So you play this whole guardian of guardian angel kind of mechanic where you're trying to get as many humans out there as possible and buff them up with this Sigarda Champions of Light card. That's pretty cool. I like that. I don't play a lot of white. But I do like green, and, and that's very interesting. I love this coven mechanic because I felt like a lot of the party, it's basically the party mechanic where you have a wizard, a, a rogue, a, a warrior, that kind of thing. Um, and I nev I've never found myself actually paying attention to the party mechanic. I have a bunch of cards, especially in my like elf deck, that um, participate in the party mechanic that have party mechanic triggers, but... I've never built around it, and I think the coven, coven ability is something that's just a little bit more natural to build around because you're not worried about the creature types. You can just worry about the power difference between all of your creatures. Um, and so that's interesting. And the nice thing about it is that uh, it takes into account your, your one ones, your counters. So if you have three four fours, that's not a coven, but if you bump one one of them up to a 6-6 six, six, and another one up to a 5-5, five, five, then all of a sudden you have a coven with those three cards because they all have different power levels. Um, they also revealed uh, some dual lands, which is great. Everyone loves a good dual land, especially during the spooky season. Uh, we've got Desert Beach, which is uh, white-blue. We've got Haunted Ridge, which is a black-red. Um, oh, Desert Beach enters the battlefield tapped unless you control two or more other lands. Okay. Uh, overgrown Farmland, which is a green-white. Rockfall Vale, which is red-green. And Shipwreck Marsh, which is blue-black. And they all have the enter tapped unless you control two or more lands. And then we've got the um, Eternal Night treatment on these full art lands that... When we did the reveal event a few weeks ago, um, I could not shut up about these cards, and I still, they have got to be my favorite land cards of all time. They're so stellar. And they also revealed that they're doing um, some Eternal Night treatments on some of the actual uh, creature cards, and that we'll get into in a sec when we jump over to the variants uh, list. So... Because, agreed, yes, oh my god, I just want a whole playset of these lands. I, I just want to, uh, I wish one of the swamps was a bit darker. These two the swamps? Yeah, I guess so. I think, 
I, I have loved and followed Dan Mumford um, for a really long time, and he's got this kind of like old school tattoo, thick lines, kind of cartoony vibe to him, but it's still kind of haunted and, and dreary. Um, I agree that both of them, one of them could look more like it's in nighttime, but I think that that's the... Um, kind of balance you have to try to find with the uh, purely black and white cards. I shoot a lot of black and white photography, so it's I, I know how tricky it can be to balance a full frame with both black and white color and devoid of color. Um, and yeah, I really love Dan Mumford's art. I really like this set of lands that he's done, but I think I prefer the non-Dan Mumford ones. Um, I will try to collect full playsets of both because I want I want 10 of each. I'm going to go to my LGS and I'm just going to throw some cash on the counter and say, give me 10 of each. I don't care. Um, the nice thing is, is that they are going to be included in most of the normal booster packs. So you have a chance of getting these special land treatments in just... Uh, standard draft boosters and set boosters which normally isn't the case a lot of the times you have to get the collector's boosters I still like them a lot uh, I just wish there was one match the island and mountain oh yeah I see what you're talking about The this mountain here and this island here are definitely a lot kind of darker in general than the other island, the other land cards I get that. This island is probably my favorite one, actually. This wizard standing here with throwing a lightning bolt, this giant wave crashing. It's just so good. These clouds. Who's the artist? Evan Kegel. That's that's just bonkers, this card. I love it so much. Um, yeah, so you do have a chance to get these in the normal boosters. Um, normally, you would have to buy the collector's boosters to get stuff like this. Uh, so they're not making them as rare because there's going to be a lot more Eternal Night style cards in this set. Um, so a big mechanic returning. Uh, you thought we were done with the cards, didn't you? Um, a big mechanic returning for Innistrad is double face cards. Because there's a day-night cycle, there's a lot of double face cards in Innistrad. A lot of them are werewolves slash monsters. Um, and so we'll go through some of these double face cards. A lot of them are very, very cool mechanics. And so each one of these has a day and a night um, side, so depending on the board state, because now the day-night cycle is full board state. It's not just single cards anymore. Um, depending on the state of the board, when you play these cards, it will either enter on its night day side or on its night side. And as the board state switches, you have to switch all of your cards to day or night. Um, which is going to be a huge pain in the ass for people who well, play sleeved because everyone plays sleeved and you have to pull your card out of your sleeve, switch them over. <laughs> um, so the first one, the first double face card here is Beloved Beggar. It's one in a white for a zero four human peasant. So he's a good blocker, basically a wall. Um, he has a Disturb cost, so for 4 and a white-white, you may cast this card from your graveyard, transformed for its Disturbed cost. So, transformed, um, this beggar becomes a Generous Soul. He's a creature spirit, 4-4, four, four, with Flying and Vigilance. If Generous Soul would be put into a graveyard from anywhere, exile it instead. So you can't play this card and expect to keep it on the board. As soon as it dies, because it's a ghost, it goes away forever and doesn't come back. So we've got Beloved Beggar on one side and Generous Soul. And if, if you have um, Beloved Beggar in your graveyard, you can pay its Disturb cost to transform it into Generous Soul and put it on the battlefield. Um, yeah, so our next uh, double face card is Brutal Cathar. It's two and a white for a human soldier werewolf. It's two two. Pardon me. 
when this creature enters the battlefield or transforms into Brutal Cathar, exile target creature card an opponent controls until this creature leaves the battlefield. So it's kind of like Gelatinous Cube or Portable Hole. Um, basically, when Brutal Cathar enters, you exile, you... Um, you grab a creature from your opponent's board and you hold on to it until um, this card leaves the battlefield. Uh, or transforms into Brutal Cathar. Whenever this creature enters the battlefield or transforms into Brutal Cathar, exile target. Okay, so... So whatever the flip side of this card is doesn't count. If you play it Nightbound, so... Most of these cards will have a day bound or a night bound, um, which means that you can't play it. You have to play it on the other side. If it's day, if it's nighttime, you have to play it on the night side. If it's daytime, you have to play it on the day side, which is the same for for all of them. Um, but this one has a cat, um, an ability that changes the board state. So his says day bound. If a player casts no spells during their own turn it becomes night the next turn. So if your opponent doesn't cast any spells, which everything counts as a spell, a creature, an instant, a sorcery, um, if they cast nothing, it becomes night. And when Brutal Cathar becomes night, it turns into Moon Rage Brute. So it's a red card. Interesting. I didn't know they did that. Moon Rage Brute. He's a 3-3 three, three creature werewolf with first strike. And he has a ward with pay three life. And then he has nightbound. If a player casts at least two spells during their own turn, it becomes day next turn. So, if you have Brutal Cathar out, and a player casts nothing, it becomes night. And if you have Moon Rage Brute out, and someone casts two spells, it becomes day. So you flip it back over. And that's that's the... That's the Brute. Uh, Moon Rage Brute and Brutal Cathar. That's a very cool card. This guy looks like he's struggling in that armor. It almost doesn't look like the same... Oh, yeah, it does. That same shoulder piece. Doesn't look like he wants to be a werewolf. But that's alright. The next double face card we have is Enduring Angel. He's two, a white, white, white. Two and three white. For a 3-3 three, three mythic rare angel creature. So this creature on its day side has flying and double strike. Which is both really good. Especially for 3-3. Three, three. Um, and you have hexproof. So the player has hexproof. So you can't be the target of spells. If your life total would be reduced to zero or less. Instead transform enduring angel and your life total becomes three. Then, if Enduring Angel didn't transform this way, you lose the game. So, this is a bit of a tricky one because there are some things that can stop you from transforming a card. Um, and so, if you were to take lethal damage, so say I had 5 health and I took 5 damage. As soon as I go to take zero damage, I would transform Enduring Angel and I'll put my life to three. Because the knight side of Enduring Angel is Angelic Enforcer, who has a power and toughness equal to your health. So it would be a 3-3. Three, three. And then whenever Angelic Enforcer attacks, double your life total. So just the simple act of attacking with Angelic Enforcer gives, makes me have six life. And then she becomes a 6-6. Six, six. And then the next turn, if I attack with her again, I, be I get 12. I have 12 life, and she becomes a 12-12. So this, this can escalate quite fast. Um, and so because people understand how crazy this card is and how expensive it is to cast and how, um, how valuable it is to have on your board, especially when you're nearing zero life, uh, people are going to remove this card pretty fast, if they can. This is going to be the main focus of any removal from your opponent as soon as you play it. Because this card can get out of control very fast. Uh, 
The next double-sided card we have is a blue card. It has... It is a one and a blue for a 2-1 bait hook angler. He's a human peasant. And it has a disturb one and a blue. You may cast this card transformed from the graveyard. And its night side is a hook haunt drifter. Basically a ghostly fisherman. And he is a 1-2 with flying. If Hook Haunt Drifter would be put into a graveyard from anywhere, exile it instead. So you get a 1-2 flyer um, that's going to be exiled when it dies. So it's kind of just one of those low mana, not terrifying. Um, I mean, the art is kind of terrifying. If I saw that at the docks, I would fucking run. Um, but as far as your opponent goes, it's not terrifying to look at, but it's very useful to have because um, it's a flyer, so you're going to be swinging through the air. You're going to be triggering all the other blue bullshit that um, triggers when you attack with flyers. It's it can get out of hand, um, and it's cheap. It's a good it's a good card to have. It's very interesting. The next blue one is a poppet stitcher. Ooh, ooh like sewing a little golem thing together. So he's two and a blue for a mythic human wizard. Two, three power and toughness. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, create a two, two black zombie creature token with decay. So decayed again is a mechanic where if a creature has decayed and it attacks, it dies after combat, no matter what. So if it deals damage, if it doesn't deal damage, it gets blocked. No matter what happens, that creature decays after combat phase. So you want to build up um, an army of decayed creatures and then swing with them all, and then they all go away after combat. So the rest of Poppet Stitcher says, at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control three or more creature tokens, you may transform Poppet Stitcher. So you can transform Poppet Stitcher without... Um, Without any board state switching, which is interesting. Um, and you can just transform it if you have three or more tokens. And as long as you're casting instants and sorceries, you'll quickly get those tokens. Because if you don't attack... So decayed creatures can't block, so they're only offensive. And if you just save up a few for a few turns, like... If you're playing blue, the chances of you casting more than one instant or sorcery in a turn is pretty high, so at worst, it takes you three turns to get three tokens. At best, you can get three tokens in one turn, because every time you cast one, you get a black zombie token. And then when you flip it, it becomes a poppet fact. Oh, no. Crows. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Creature tokens you control lose all abilities and have base power and toughness 3-3. Three, three. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may transform Poppet Factory. So, your 2-2 two, two, your two, two black zombie tokens become 3-3s, three, but they also lose decay, I think. Because decay is an ability, right? I mean, it's it's technically like rules text, but if it has no abilities, that means decay would be gone as well, I believe. So what you want to do is create as many zombie tokens as you can with Poppet Stitcher. Don't attack with any of them, just hold them back a bit. And then once you've got this army of zombie tokens, you switch to Poppet Factory, and then all of your tokens become stronger. And you've got this army of creatures now three threes you got an army of three threes and then at the beginning of your upkeep you get to choose whether or not to go back to the poppet stitcher so um say you've you've switched over to poppet factory you've got all your three three army um you attack with them all people get blocked people die and you lose some of your army you do a lot of damage which is great and everyone's having fun um well, your opponent might not be having fun, but you're having fun. So 
you attack with all these creatures, um, you lose some of your army. Say you have one or two zombies left. Um, then you decide to switch back over to Poppet Stitcher and start creating more. Then once you get, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, however many you want, you switch back over and then they all become three threes again. What does the lose control mean? So, so if you're, um, you see that on my screen or is that something in your game? The context is, so if I play this card here, bait hook angler, this creature, human peasant, when I, when I play bait hook angler, he's in my control. So he's on my board. Um, he's on my side of the game. I, c I control him. Lose abilities. Oh, so lose abilities means... Um, so this, this right here is an ability. Anything in this box that interacts with the game is an ability. So basically, when a card loses its abilities, it just becomes a blank card. So these two two black zombie creatures that you've made with Poppet Stitcher, the um, zombie. I wonder if does Gatherer have tokens? Zombie token. Hmm. Not what I was looking for. Um, so this, this zombie token is going to have decay, which means that once you attack with it, it will die no matter what. Um, but if you switch over to here, creature tokens you have lose all abilities. So that becomes, it cleans the card makes it a blank card, and gives it a base power toughness 3-3. Three, three. So it becomes a little bit stronger, but it loses its decay. So it, can no, longer, it no longer dies when you attack with it. Um, because it wipes all of the text from your card. It goes from being a card with a rule on it, a rules text, to being a card with nothing on it. And the nice thing about Poppet Factory is that... Uh, it says creature tokens you control, so it doesn't necessarily mean just the zombie creatures. You can have a bunch of token drakes. You can have a bunch of... Um, I don't know what else is in blue. What other tokens are in blue? Fairies. Fairies. Lots of fairies in blue. Um, fairies are 1-1s. One drakes are 2-2s, two I think. Uh, same with zombies. So this is a very interesting... It's definitely a Demir card because it's zombie play and zombies are normally relegated to black or black-blue interaction. So that's a very interesting um, combo to have. So you play Poppet Stitcher. You make as many tokens as you can. You can even have other things. If you, if you have uh, Roost of Drakes or, or that, that Crow card. Oh, what? That crow card was blue, right? Yeah, Ominous Roost. So if you have Ominous Roost out, every time you cast a spell from your graveyard, um, you create a blue bird token with flying. And then you have... So you build your crow tokens, you build your zombie tokens, and then you flip over Poppet Stitcher to Poppet Factory, and all of your tokens are now 3-3s, three with no other text, so it's just an army of three threes. That is really cool. That is interaction. That is cool board state um, manipulation. Very awesome. I don't think normal blue players are going to love it, but Demir players are definitely going to love it. People who play blue-black, like myself, are, are going to love that because that's very interesting. All of your tokens become puppets. Oh, it's poppet, not puppet. It's like a a poppet is like a gremlin zombie kind of thing. They're from like um, 
what's that term? What would you call Midsummer? Like Norwegian horror? Poppets are like children zombies, basically. They're little tiny guys. They're really creepy. Um, so all of your creatures become nothing. You're, all of your tokens become just 3-3 three, three creatures. They don't become anything in particular. <clears throat> and then once you've lost some of your tokens and you want to re reestablish your army, you flip back over to Poppet Stitcher and start stitching more Poppets. And then once you build up your army again, you flip back over to Poppet Factory and you get your 3-3s. Three but yes, all, all of your tokens become poppets, basically. They all become 3-3s, three no matter what. Um, the crows are 1-1s, one the drakes are 2-2s, two the um, zombies are 2-2s, two there's a lot of... Most tokens are very low level, low power, toughness, and this card makes it so that all of your tokens are 3-3, three, three, no matter what they are, and that's pretty powerful. All of a sudden, you've got a token army, and it gets out of hand. Okay, I have to use the washroom real quick. I'll be right back. Okay, sorry about that. Coffee ran through me real fast. So our next double-sided card revealed is the Bane Blade Scoundrel. Human, rogue, werewolf. That's my fucking jam. I love playing rogues. I love playing Demir. This is going in my deck for sure. It's three and a black for a 4-3 human, rogue, werewolf creature token or creature card. We, we spoke so much about tokens, I keep thinking they're tokens now. Whenever Bane Blade Scoundrel becomes blocked, each creature blocking it gets minus one, minus one until end of turn. That is bonkers. So you have to keep that in mind when you go to block the Bane Blade Scoundrel. And it also has Daybound. So if a player casts no spells during their own turn, it becomes night next turn. And when it becomes night, Bane Blade Scoundrel transforms into Bane Claw Marauder. 5-4 werewolf, werewolf creature. Whenever Bane B Claw Marauder becomes blocked, each creature gets minus one, minus one, so the same thing. Whenever a creature blocking Bane Claw Marauder dies, that creature's controller loses one life. That is brutal. And then it has Nightbound. If a player casts at least two spells during their own turn, it becomes day. So this is another card that has day and Nightbound, which will help um, stimulate the day-night cycles on the board. Um, if a player casts no spells during their turn, it becomes night. So all of your creatures flip over to their night sides. And then... It has night bound on this side, so if a player casts two or more spells during their turn, it becomes day. So you flip it back over to its day side. And that's pretty cool. That's a great... Uh, I love that it's rogue. I love that it's a werewolf rogue. Um, I kind of wish the Marauder, the backside of this card, was also a rogue. Because then it, uh, any of my buffs that um, touch rogues kind of goes away once it flips over. Whereas they're, they're extremely relevant on this side, but not relevant at all on this side. 
But I assume it's hard for a werewolf to be sneaky, roguelike, so it's fair. I'll give him that. I'll give him that. All right, Watsy, you can have that one. The next black card is Curse of Leeches. Look at that art. It's got like steam coming out of his mouth. Or he's vaping. Maybe he's just vaping. Speaking of which, I've been quitting smoking and... It's tricky, but luckily there's some very handy nicotine products that help me transition. So I feel this guy. This is what I feel like right now. This guy right here. Just trying to vape and get my nicotine and not get whatever black sludge is on my eyeballs like that. So this is an or a curse aura. And curses are something that affects... They're auras that you can put on other players. Curses are very Innistrad. Um, they're very spooky. They're very um, horror-themed. They're not prevalent in a lot of other sets, but now that we're returning to Innistrad, of course they're going to bring back curses. So, Curse of Leeches. Two and a black for an aura curse. Enchant player. At this, as this permanent transforms into Curse of Leeches, attach it to a player. At the beginning of Enchanted Player's upkeep, they lose one life and you gain one life. So you attach it to your your opponent. Um, at the beginning of Enchanted, at their at the beginning of their upkeep. So when their turn starts, they lose a life and I gain a life. But this card also has Daybound. So, if a player casts no spells during their turn, it will become night. And the night side of this card is Leaking, Leeching Lurker. The 4-4 four, four Leech Horror with Lifelink. And it has Nightbound. So, this is one of those cards where you want it to be day, because it's a curse. And then that curse becomes a creature. Um, wait, does that, does that mean the other player gets that creature? Or okay, when I play this uh, enchantment aura curse, do I put it on my battlefield, or do I put it on their battlefield? I must put it on my battlefield, right? There's no way I'm giving them a four-four creature. That doesn't make any sense. So it has to go on my battlefield, and I just name my opponent as the cursed player. And then they lose a life and I gain a life if it's on the curse side. And then when it becomes night, that curse turns into a creature, a leech horror with lifelink. Fantastic. The next um, dual card is the heirloom mirror. It's one and a black for an artifact. And this artifact has pay one and tap to pay a life, discard a card, draw a card, mill a card, then put a ritual counter on heirloom mirror. Then, if it has three or more ritual counters on it, remove them and transform it. Activate it only as a sorcery. So you flip the card over, and it becomes Inherited Fiend, a 4-4 creature demon with flying. And you can pay two and a black to exile target creature card from a graveyard and put a 1-1 counter on Inherit. So this is kind of like the... Um, What is the name of that card? In Ingesting Ooze? There's an Ooze card that lets you take cards from graveyards and put counters on it. Um, and this is exactly the same thing, except for it starts as a 4-4. I think the Ooze starts as a 2-2. Two -two. Um, so it takes a while. You have to give up some stuff in order to um, transform it. But once it transforms, it's a pretty powerful creature with a really nice ability. It's an expensive ability, so it's something you're going to have to work towards. This is sort of like end game stuff. You can make Inherited Fiend really buff. Um, it's not a tap ability, so you can pay this as many times as you want in a turn if you can afford it. So he can go from a 4 4 to a 10 10 if you have a shit ton of mana. The next dual sided card is a Tavern Ruffian. He's three and a red. 
for a human warrior werewolf with a 2-5 power toughness. And there's nothing special here, it just has day bound. So if the if a player casts no spells during their turn, it becomes night. The next turn. So at the start of the next turn, switches over to night, and then this card flips. And it is a tavern smasher. Ooh. Gets angry at the tavern. And he's just a 6-5 with Nightbound. So if a player casts at least two spells during their turn, it becomes day the next turn. So we'll switch back over. So it's just a fucking just pure red card here. All aggro all the time. He's even aggro when he's a 2-5. Look at that face. Just aggro as hell. And then he becomes an angry beast and is even more aggro. So the next card is uh, another red. It's Village Watch. It's four and a red for a human werewolf. But it's like a group of werewolves. Uh, four, three, power toughness. It has haste, so that's pretty good. Why it costs five. It's a little bit more expensive than your tavern ruffian. Um, and it also has day bound. So if a player doesn't play anything during their turn, it becomes night, and then you get village reavers. Oh no. All those people on the watch become werewolves, and they just have a pack of werewolves. So it becomes a 5-4 werewolf with wolves, and werewolves you control have haste. So your entire board that are wolves or werewolves have haste. That is pretty great. That is a red-ass card right there. That is the most red-ass, red-ass card I've ever seen. Um, and then it has Nightbound, so if somebody plays two or more spells during their turn, it becomes Day, and you flip it back over. Um, the next card is Arlen, the Pax Hope, which is a very famous character in the Innistrad realm and Magic Planeswalkers. Uh, it's two, a red, and a green. Legendary Planeswalker, Arlen. So Arlen has Daybound, so if a player casts no spells during their turn, it becomes Night, so you'll flip it over. But let's check out the, the daytime side first. So she enters the battlefield with four loyalty counters. You can pay one, you can plus one loyalty to until your next turn. You may cast creature spells as though they had flash. And each creature you control enters the battlefield with an additional 1-1 one, one counter on it. So just as plus loyalty abilities go, that's pretty fucking dope. Um... You can play anything as if it has flash until your next turn. So during your entire opponent's turn, you can play creatures as if they have flash. You can throw in blockers. Um, and everything you cast enters with an additional 1-1 one, one counter on it. So you can throw out a bunch of cheap guys, get some, make them a little bit more buff, and block some stuff, which is really great. And then her minus three loyalty ability has create two. I hate when they do this. Create two, two, two green wolf creature tokens. So you minus three and you get two wolf tokens. Um, and then it has day bound. So if a player casts no spells during their own turn, it becomes night the next turn. And when you flip Arlen over, she becomes Arlen of the Moon's Fury. Legendary Planeswalker. It's got the green red little symbol there so that you know what colors it is. Um, it has Nightbound, obviously, so it'll flip back over if someone plays two or more spells in a turn. It has a plus two ability add uh, green and red mana, which is fine. Um, it has a zero ability until end of turn. Arlen the Moon's, Fu Moon's Fury becomes a 5 5 werewolf creature with trample, indestructible, and haste. So there aren't many planeswalkers that become creatures, and this is one of them. Uh, becomes a 5-5 werewolf. Pretty great card. Uh, this is going to be, obviously it's mythic. It's going to be a staple in um, green-red for Innistrad for sure. As, uh, add mana, become a 5-5. On the other side, it has play creatures with flash. Add 1-1s, one -ones, and then you get two wolf creature tokens. It's just a generally general great card. Um, I wouldn't say that it's game breaking or that it's. I wouldn't even say that it's game winning. 
I don't know that Arlen is your uh, win con, but it is very useful, and every single ability on this card is very playable and will help you out a lot. The next dual sided card is the De Devoted Graph Keeper. Those look like graves. What's a graph? The Graph Keeper. Like it's just a magic thing. Interesting. Okay. So the devoted graph keeper is white and blue. He's a human peasant, two one. When devoted graph keeper enters the battlefield, mill two cards. So you mill cards. Whenever you cast a spell from your graveyard, tap target creature you don't control. So that's handy. If you're casting stuff from your graveyard, you can tap your opponent's creatures. It has a disturb cost, so you can play this card. In its transformed phase, for one, a white, and a blue. And then when it transforms, it becomes a departed soul keeper. So instead of tending the graves, it now tends all the souls that are in the graveyard. It is a 3-1 spirit with flying. Departed soul keeper can block only creatures with flying. If departed soul keeper would be put into a graveyard from anywhere, exile it instead. So, just like that... Um, Generous soul, beloved beggar. Um, when the corporeal being dies, it becomes a spirit, and that spirit, once it dies, becomes exiled for the rest of the game. And then the very last card we have here in this normal gallery is Tavolar, Dire Overlord. And this card is a, another blue green, or not blue green, another red green um, legendary creature, human werewolf. Comes on the battlefield as a 3 3, which is pretty good. Uh, whenever a wolf or werewolf you control deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. Instant. Instantly put this card in your, in your deck if you're playing red green. Draw cards from wolf or werewolf combat damage to a player. Like, that's. That's so much card draw. Especially if you're playing all Innistrad stuff and you've got a ton of werewolves and wolves. That's so great. Um, at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control three or more wolves or werewolves, it becomes night. Then transform any number of human werewolves you control. And it has day bound, so if somebody, doesn't, if somebody goes through their whole turn without casting any spells, it becomes night. Um, at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control three or more werewolves, it becomes night. So when you when it becomes night, Tavolar flips over to become the Midnight Scourge. And you can see he's still holding on to his um, sword here, which the uh, Wizards of the Coast people made sure to point out that he is the only or the first card to ever hold on to his signature weapon when he transforms because this sword is very important to him, apparently. Um, I don't know anything about Tavolar. So we'll just have to wait until the book comes out and find out. Um, so Tavolar the Midnight Scourge is his nighttime side. Whenever a wolf or werewolf you control deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. So he maintains the draw card ability. But then he has pay X, a red and a green, and target wolf or werewolf you control gets plus X plus zero and gains trample until end of turn. So you buff, you can buff wolves and werewolves with the night side, um, and you can flip it over to the night side with the day side. And then there's also night bound, which means if someone plays two or more spells during their turn, it becomes day, back and forth, yada yada. So there's lots of really cool cards, dual cards in this set, obviously, because it's in Estrad and werewolves and monsters, lots of really cool stuff. Um, I don't, should I do mechanics next or look at the card variants? Let's look at the variants. Um, okay, 
So these are variant versions of the normal cards. Uh, some of these are from previous sets that are reprints. Some of these are new to Innistrad. Midnight Hunt is a set. Um, Avacyn's Memorial is a reprint. Five uh, white, white, white. Legendary Artifact, Indestructible. Other legendary permanents you control have Indestructible. This is a very um, powerful white card that's played a lot, especially in Commander, because there's a lot of legendary permanents in Commander decks, um, and all of your legendary permanents have Indestructible. Visions of Glory is another uh, reprint, I believe. It is four and a white for a sorcery. You create a 1-1 one, one human token for each creature you control. And then it has flashback, eight, white, white. This spell costs X less to cast this way, where X is the greatest mana value amongst... The greatest mana value of a commander you own on the battlefield or in the command zone. So, if you want to play Visions of Glory as a flashback card from the graveyard, um, you get to pay X less, where X is the mana value of your commander. And then there's some variants... Um, yeah, the Dawn Guard is another card we went over. Here's some full art splash. Uh, Visions of Duplicity, I believe, is a reprint. Exchange control of two target creatures you don't control. So this is interesting, especially in commander decks. Flashback, the spell costs X less, where X is the greatest mana value of a commander you own, or on the battlefield, or in the command zone. Again, becomes cheaper the more powerful your commander is to cast. Um, there's a variant on the Triska file. There's some variants on Consider. There's an art variant um, on the Triska file. Visions of Dread. Okay, this this is the one I wanted to talk about the most. So Jadar. Ghoul Caller of Nefalia is a great card, sure, but it's this art. So the same way that they did, um, so these are called Eternal Night Treatments. So they pull all the color out of these cards, and again, these are my favorite art treatments ever to be made in Magic. And they're doing the same thing with some legendary creatures. They're called Eternal Night Treatments, and they are just astoundingly creepy, the black and white, the um, the variants on the art style, it's just incredibly stellar. This weird neon kind of border that they're choosing to do uh, with all the colors, it's extremely, um, sorry, A Facebook miss, what's the difference between those two cards, Visions of Dread? Oh, um. Right, where was I? Uh, there's there's no difference between these two cards, just the art. So this is the normal card here, um, and then this is the extended art that goes all the way to the edge of the card. It basically um, removes the border from the art. Just a fancy um, art treatment. Just much like this one, where it's like this card is the exact same as the normal J Jadar card. Um, it just looks different. So lots of collectors, lots of people who are... There's lots of Magic players that are art-focused. They really like hunting for the rare arts and the, the alternative arts. Um, this new Eternal Night treatment is absolutely astounding. Um, I am so madly in love with it, and I'm going to collect as many of these Eternal Night art treatments as I can. Um, here's the Champion of the Perished in the Extended Border. Um, and then there's the Art Variant Extended Border for Champion of the Perished. There is the uh, Border Treatment on this Infernal Grass, which is cool. Um, yeah, we've got some Extended Borders for Light Up the Night and Curse of Obsession. Visions of Dominance, the full art card version of Ren and Seven. And then we've got these really, really interesting um, kind of
kind of natural borders for stuff like Sarith the Viper's Fang, that really dope card that's definitely going in my Wither Fang deck. Um, and these ones are green specific, this little uh, leaf treatment with the vines and stuff on the side. Um, yeah, some multicolored, so the Wilt Helt, the Rot Cleaver. So these are some new ish cards. Maybe I should go over these. Um, the Leonor Autumn Sovereign is two green and a white for a legendary human noble, zero four power toughness. And she has Coven. So at the beginning of a combat on your turn, put a one one counter on up to one target creature you control. Wait, sorry. Do I get those just as the luck of the draw in an extended pack, or can I actually buy card decks with extended borders? Uh, it's all luck, mostly. Um, if you want to... Sorry, it's just a little awkward to open Facebook and, and check those messages. Um, it's probably more awkward for you to type in Twitch chat, but that's fine. Um, it's just the luck of the draw. You can go to... If you go to a, a game store, a card shop, um, they will most likely have the art variants for sale as singles because what they do is when a new set comes out, they buy a bunch, they write off a bunch of the packs, um, open them, and then sell the cards as singles because they know a lot of people want to buy singles. They don't want to leave things up to chance. They want to go... They want to go to the store and get this special art treatment of Sarith the Viper's Fang, so they don't have to worry about opening a million packs to try to get one. They can just go to the store and buy this art treatment if they have any in stock. Um, and that is why most of the art treatments uh, are worth more money. So if you get a, a rare art treatment, it's generally worth at least a few more bucks than the normal version of the card is worth. Sometimes the rarity um, bumps that up to, you know, twice the amount of money. Um, but yeah, lots of these local game stores, the, the majority of their well-being and business is made from singles. So if you're looking for a specific art style and a specific card, definitely go to a local card shop and ask if they have any in stock um, and buy them just straight up as singles because... It helps them out, and you don't have to search for them. Um, yeah. So Lenore Autumn Sovereign has Coven. Her Coven ability is, at the beginning of combat on your turn, put a 1-1 one, one counter on a one target creature you control. Then, if you control three or more creatures with different powers, draw a card. So you get to put a 1-1 one, one counter out, and you get to draw cards. This is a fantastic card to put in any white-green deck. Uh, next, we've got a Demir card. It's to Will Helt, the Rot Cleaver. He's got this cool ghostly axe here. Um, he's two, a blue and a black for a legendary zombie warrior, 3-3. Three, three. Whenever another zombie you control dies, if it didn't have Decayed, create a 2-2 two, two black zombie creature with Decayed. At the beginning of your end step, you may sacrifice a zombie to draw a card. Which is really cool. I think this paired with the blue um, Stitcher card we were looking at, uh, Poppet Factory, Poppet Stitcher. I think Poppet Stitcher paired with uh, Rock Cleaver is going to be pretty pretty interesting. You can really start making those tokens really fast, and and then flip over to Poppet Factory and have a big army of tokens. And then there's some extended art for these guys. Uh, Sigarda, the Champion of Light that we talked about, um, where was she? Oh, right there. She's not a dual card, she's just a single-sided. Um, this legendary angel creature that buffs humans, she's getting the Eternal Knight treatment. Uh, looks really, really fantastic. I love the way that they're going, like, hyper-gothic with these black and white card treatments. We got extended art for the Galvanic iteration, and then we've got some fancy borders for Join the Dance. The 
Dual lands are also getting full art treatments, which are really great. Uh, these are really gorgeous. We've got some um, standard lands here that are pretty nice looking. And then we've got some double face cards. So each of these double face cards are going to be um, semi thematic on the borders, depending on what colors they represent. Um, but let's go over look at Arlen's got this full art version. And so she's got Arlen of Pax Hope. This is a very young version of Arlen here in the art. And then when she flips over, she is Arlen the Moon's Fury. Very cool looking uh, art variant. Full art, again, borderless. And then we go over to these spectacular border treatments. I cannot express how amazing these full color border treatments are. Much like the green ones up here. Um, they're just they're just absolutely astounding. I love all the detail work in these. Um, so Brutal Cathar is getting the border treatment, um, and the Moon Rage Brute on the other side is a lot darker. Obviously, the colors and the borders and the textures in these borders kind of reflect the color of the cards. It's got a little sun here on the top left corner to describe to show you that it's the day side and then a moon on the night side. Absolutely gorgeous. I think I really loved the Caltime border treatments, but these are these are just one step above. Um, and the same with Baneblade Scoundrel here. So you've got the the day side with the the nice border, human rogue, werewolf, and then you switch it over to the bone bane claw marauder, and it's just a creepy, extra detailed um, look at that creature. And again, it's got the darker border with the thorns and the little ripped sides, and it's got the moon in the top left. It's just really, really, really great. Uh, we've got the border treatment for the tavern ruffian, so art variant here. Flip it over, still got the art variant and the border treatment. Absolutely gorgeous. The village watch, that group of werewolves with haste. Those flip over to become the Reavers, which again has the border treatment and is absolutely stunning. Arlen the Pax Hope, this dual colored card, you can see it kind of transitions from, from red accents on this side to green accents on this side. Also stunning. Um, and the backside, the Moon Night side art for Arlen the Moon's Fury is fucking vicious. This is. This is Miyazaki, um, Demon Souls, Bloodborne type art. This is absolutely brutal, horror, craziness, and it's just, it's a really, really cool. And the border treatment, again, it's just probably my favorite border treatment in all of Magic. Um, Tavolar is also getting the border treatment with the alt art style in the center. Um, Enduring Angel is getting full art bleeds. Same with Poppet Stitcher, full art bleeds. Uh, and then this Vape Leeches is also getting that. So those are some of the art treatments, the special variants. Um, so we've got these really, really crazy, um, gorgeous border treatments with the heavy blacks. Um, in the art styles and then we've got the full bleed borderless full arts and then jumping back to the gorgeous lands and stuff we've got the eternal night art variants which there are a few eternal night creatures legendary creatures I don't know if they're going to do any normal creatures in the eternal night but it's very gorgeous I cannot wait collect all of these different art styles. Um, I want everything in border, the border treatment. I want everything in the internal nights. Um, I want all those lands. I want just this whole set is just crazy impressing me and I can't wait to collect as much of it as I can. Um, again, I think we're only a week away from the pre-release event so we can go in and get our pre-release pack and open some cards and make a little 
uh, tiny deck and <coughs> and have some fun. Uh, where to find Innistra Midnight Hunt teasers? Okay, product page boosters. Let's check out the mechanics. So we went through all the cards. Um, there's a ton of new mechanics. Not a ton. A handful of new mechanics. Some of them I tried to explain. Some of them I probably tried to explain and did a poor job of. Um, I am going to run and grab another coffee, and then we will get into the mechanics here. So I will be... Right, is that cut off weird? No, that's fine. Um, I will be right back, and we will jump into these mechanics. So hold tight. Hello. So we're going to run through the mechanics here. Uh, like I said, I tried explaining them to the best of my knowledge, but hopefully there'll be some more elaborate explanations in this article written by uh, Matt Tabak over at Wizards of the Coast. Um, 
Quick interlude about transforming double face cards. Transforming double face cards, like the Tavern Smasher and Tavern Ruffian, can be cast with their front faces up. And if they are put onto the battlefield without being cast, they are put onto the battlefield front face up. One easy way to tell if a double face card is transforming as opposed to module, like cards from previous sets such as Strixhaven or School of Mages, is that each transforming double face cards will have an ability that either transforms it into their other face or has it enter the battlefield or be cast transformed. The back faces of transforming double face cards don't have mana cost because they can't usually be trans cast transformed, although the new Disturb ability provides an exception. That's coming up in a bit. If you ever need to know the mana value of, a back, of the back of a transforming double face card, use the mana cost of the front face. For example, the mana value of Tavern Smasher is 4. That's a little strange, we know, but when your opponent tries to cast Eliminate, destroy target creature or planeswalker with mana value 3 or more, on it, it can't, and you'll be thankful. Sorry, I just have a nasty taste in my mouth. Okay, in some uncommon cases, it may become night first because a permanent with nightbound appears first. The important thing is that once it's day or night, the game will be exactly one of those designations, day or night, going back and forth until the game ends. It, can't, it can never return to being neither, and the whole game is either day or night. It's not a per-player thing. If it's day, each double-faced card with daybound and nightbound will enter the battlefield with its daybound face up. If it's night, each of them will enter with its nightbound face up. Note that this doesn't affect spells on the stack. Even during night, if you cast Tavern Ruffian, it will be Tavern Ruffian on the stack. As the spell resolves, it will simply, simply enter the battlefield as Tavern Smasher. So you play Tavern Ruffian, that's the card you're playing, and then once it hits the battlefield, it decides, it checks the, the state of the game. If it's daybound, or if it's nighttime, it will switch over. If it's daytime, it will stay as Tavern Ruffian. From day to night and back again, there are two ways for the game's day-night designation to change. The first should be familiar to those who have visited Innistrad before. If it's day as a turn begins, and the previous turn's active player didn't cast a spell the last turn, it becomes night. Similarly, if it's night as the turn begins, and the player's the previous turn's active player casts two or more spells, it becomes day. To help everyone keep track of the day-night, many Innistrad Midnight Hunt booster packs have this helper card that also reminds you of these rules. So you just have one of these cards out on the battlefield at all times, um, and it will remind you what the state of the board is. I'm really hoping that... Um, Magic the Gathering Arena has a really cool effect on the board states, uh, whether it's day or night. I'm really hoping that they do this in the digital game, because as much as I love this card, helpful for playing Paper Magic, um, I think there's some extra avenue for expressiveness in Arena, where it's all digital. As you can see, the card that helps you understand whether it's day or night is also double-faced, UX designer Daniel Holt points out, it's only made sense that the helper card itself be double-faced. That way you can transform on the battlefield to indicate what day-night designation it was in. Other than that, we wanted beautiful new art to be the main focal point of the rules, text floating on the image, and most of the frame elements were removed. I don't know about beautiful artwork, but it's worth noting that any rules also say other way it's worth noting, the rules also say another way to become day and night designation can change is when some cards have effects that just say it becomes day or night. This can happen at any point in the turn when the effect says so. Transforming. This is the good part. As it becomes day, all double face cards with night bound transform to their day bound faces. 
As it becomes night, all double face cards with day bound transform to their night bound faces. In other words, these double face cards should always be in sync, no matter who controls them. What's more, permanence with day bound and night bound can't transform any other way. The bound part of day bound and night bound is very serious. And then there's a different mechanic called disturb. Disturb also appears on transforming double faced cards, but these do not transform on the battlefield. Rather, Disturb allows you to cast these cards transformed from your graveyard. Death, you see, is only the beginning. Ooh, spooky. Um, so, like the bait hook angler, uh, you play it the first time, and it is a 2 1 human peasant. It dies, and then you can play it for its disturbed cost, and it becomes the haunt, Hook Haunt Drifter. This card does not flip over with the day-night cycle changes. It only flips over when you cast it from your graveyard for its disturbed cost. Coven is that new ability we talked about where you have to have three creatures with different power, um, and then you get your Coven ability. Stuff like Trample, um, stuff like Sacrifice Candle, key Trap, um, Mist of the Old Ways has Draw a Card. And, and that's it, it seems. And then they've got some, some info on the booster products and set boosters. So these are all the new to magic cards you'll find in the set boosters. They break down all the math for what you get in a booster pack. Um, so the set boosters, you get one art card. You get one double or single-faced rare or mythic. You get one foil double or single-faced. Uh, you get a double or single-faced, two double or single-faced. You get two double single-faced CU, common or uncommon. Um, you get two times single-faced uncommon, three times single-faced common. One time, Eternal Night Full Art Basic Land. So every single set booster will come with one, one Eternal Night Full Art Basic Land. Uh, that's the black and white full art land cards. Um, you'll get one token uh, or add card or helper card or card from the list. Uh, draft boosters are going to work in a similar way. You get uh, one double-faced Uncommon Rare Mythic, you get one single-faced Uncommon Rare Mythic, you get one double-faced Common, two single-faced Uncommon, nine single-faced Common, one Eternal Knight Full Art Land, one Helper Card, one Token or Add Card. And then you've got Collector's Boosters, which is going to give you a little bit more fancy stuff. So you get one Foil Showcase, Borderless, or Main Set, Extended Rare or Mythic. You get one showcase or borderless rare or mythic. You get one foil showcase equinox, common or uncommon, so the uh, fancy borders. You get two showcase equinox, common or uncommons. You get one extended art commander, rare or mythic. You get one extended art main set, rare or mythic. One foil rare or mythic. Two foil uncommons. Four foil commons. One foil Eternal Night full art basic land. Oh my god, they're making foil Eternal Night lands? I didn't even know that. And then you get one foil double-sided token. Uh, the pre-release pack, which is the stuff that's going to come out uh, next week, you get a nice little box and some die. Excited to jump in and play with Innistrad Midnight Hunt cards. Pre-release packs are perfect for you. Pre-release packs include six draft boosters to open and build a sealed deck, a spin down life counter, traditional foil promotional card, and a box to hold it all in. So luckily we're going back, we're straying away from D&D, so we finally get some more spin down life counters instead of D20s. Um, I really hope I get these. Oh, does it give you a random one? Ooh. Okay. So inside the pre-release pack, you'll get six draft boosters, one traditional foil or rare foil rare or mythic card with the foil year stamp can be double-faced. So it might be random. 
I don't think it will be. Uh, three double-faced helper cards. So you're going to have uh, three copies of the day-night cards. You get one 20-sided spin-down life counter uh, with the Innistrad Midnight Hunt symbol on it. You get one Magic Arena card uh, to redeem for store packs of Innistrad Midnight Hunt. And you get one reusable deck box with divider. And that's all in the pre-release packs. Usually the pre-release packs are like 30 bucks. And you get to play with some Innistrad cards a week early. It's a lot of fun. Um, then they've got some commander decks. The two commanders for Midnight Hunt are the cards we already went over. Leonore Autumn Sovereign is green-white. And then Will Helt the Rot Cleaver is black-blue. Uh, I'm definitely going to get the black blue one so I can add more Demir cards to my set. Um, yeah, you get 100 cards, including two traditional foil legendary creature cards, one foil etched display commander, 10 double sided tokens, one life wheel, one reusable deck box. And these deck boxes are generally fucking terrible. Um, almost any time Wizards of the Coast puts a deck box, in your bundle or pre-release package. It is fucking horrendous. It's just a paper, a cardboard box. It's not even cardboard. It's it's closer to paper than it is cardboard. Um, I don't ever use them really. I use the Dragon Shield boxes more than I use the uh, Watsy package boxes. Um, and yeah, so you get all of that in your commander deck. Uh, then they have bundles, which is the thing that I usually buy because it comes with a little card box. Um, and the, again, the card boxes aren't absolutely stellar. They're definitely a step above the plain white cardboard card boxes you can buy from collector stores, uh, but they're way smaller. Um, and so they've switched out the contents of bundles this time around. So instead of getting 10 draft boosters, we now get eight set boosters. So the exact same amount of cards, we just get different variants of chances. So I'm for, I for one am all for it because I think the set boosters come with more interesting cards than the draft boosters. I think there's better chances for um, showcase stuff. Um, it does mean that you can't buy a bundles and then hold a draft with your friends which kind of sucks, but it's totally fine. And it also comes with you know, the standard lands, which for Innistrad are pretty cool. And then the... Um, what is the word I'm looking for? It's down here. Exclusive, oversized, 20-sided, glow-in-the-dark spin-down life counter. So there's always a oversized spin-down life counter in the bundles, and... The Innistrad Midnight Hunt one is kind of like a creamy color, but is glow in the dark. I have, because I've purchased a lot of bundles, I think like six or seven now, I have a lot of the um, oversized life spin down counters, and I love them. We use them every time we play Magic here um, at my house. So you get eight uh, set boosters, you get 20 traditional foil lands, you get 20 non foil lands. You get one promotional alternative art traditional foil Triska Decafile card exclusive to the bundle, which is this guy here. Um, you get an oversized 20-sided glow-in-the-dark spin-down life counter, and then you get one card storage box, which the art on this one isn't super cool or anything. I really like the D&D ones because it has like a dragon scale pattern on it, and I find that to be really awesome. Um, and then they've got theme boosters, so if you want white or blue or black or red or green, um, or just werewolves, you can just buy a werewolves pack. Um, yeah, I think that's it. It's weird that they didn't go into, uh, okay, well, let's take a look at Gissa eventually. Let's try to find Tinkerer's Cube, Booster Products, Collecting Innistrad Midnight Hunt. Uh, so the boosters are going to have your uh, Equinox cards, Showcase Equinox. You have a chance to open one of these. 
Um, each booster comes with one Eternal Knight basic land. Um, there's a couple different options for your borderless cards. You get tokens, collectors, boosters. Um, hmm. I guess they don't have a... They don't have a collector's, not a collector's, a gift bundle for Innistrad? Interesting. You the guards explore the world. Hmm. This is the list we already went over, right? Yeah. Interesting. I usually really like buying both the bundle and the gift bundle. Hmm. I wonder, let me just take a look at my store. Here. See if they have any... Reorder Midnight Hunt. So they have the pre-release listed at thirty four ninety nine. They have the bundles at forty four ninety nine. Oh, the pre-release isn't until the seventeenth. So that's two weeks from now, not one week from now. Two weeks from now is pre-release weekend, and then the full set is released on the twenty fourth. And yeah, it doesn't look like they have gift bundles on this list. So we're definitely going to be picking up a pre-release bundle. Um, if you're in the Fraser Valley or near Abbotsford, House of Cards people, I absolutely love and adore them. Definitely give them your money. Um, yeah, so it doesn't look like there's going to be a gift bundle. That's interesting. Um, so here's one of the new cards that they re just revealed. Her name is Gissa Glorious Resurrector, and she's getting the Eternal Knight treatment for her alternative art. Really awesome looking. Uh, she's two, a black, a black, for a 4-4 four, four human wizard, legendary creature. If a creature an opponent controls would die, exile it instead. At the beginning of your upkeep, put all creature cards exiled with Gissa Glorious Resurrector onto the battlefield under your control. They gain decay. So again, we're talking about that decay mechanic where when you attack with a creature that has decay, it will die. Uh, you have to sacrifice it at the end of combat. So basically, every time your opponent loses a creature, you put it aside in an exile pile, and then at the beginning of your upkeep, you can put all creatures exiled with Gissa um, onto the battlefield under your control, but you can only attack with them once, and then they die again. Um, so this is a very... You can see that she's laughing maniacally in this first one, and the second one she's kind of doing like a what are you going to do about it face. Um, and that's pretty much the fucking gist of this card. It's... <laughs> you get to kill a bunch of um when you kill a bunch of your opponent's creatures you get to attack them with their creatures the next turn and it's like what are you gonna do about it no, are you gonna protect uh gisa glorious resurrector are you gonna try to take her out i think you're she's gonna be a main focus for sure um and she has a brother garalf um who is a blue creature and they are going to be revealing a Garolf card for Innistrad soon. They have not revealed it yet. That's it. That's, that's pretty much all we've got to look at right now. Um, there is an interesting look at um, 
some of the mechanics that Mark Rosewater kind of ran down. There's some uh, literature to read about the Witch of the Woods, Arlen. There is a another uh, piece of lore written by Shanine McGuire that surrounds uh, Ren and... Pardon me. That's all about Ren and Seven. That's very interesting. Um, and then, yeah, they have the full card gallery and then the full variance gallery up on their websites. And we're still two weeks away from pre-release, so there's going to be lots of interesting reveals in the next few.